And uh, now I will uh, kindly ask Michael Kirk of uh, RMK Maritime to take the podium. Uh, Michael is going to tackle a very interesting topic, the topic of consolidation in shipping. We have seen uh, a number of deals in the market uh, of ship, uh, shipping companies merging, buying one uh, another, and uh, we're delighted that uh, Mike, who has been an advisor actually to a number of those deals, can uh, take us through and enlighten us, give us his insight. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Mike Kirk with RMK Maritime and RMK Capital. RMK was recently an advisor to Euronav on the proposed acquisition of Generate. Um, I'm not here to talk about that specific transaction. We're going to talk more generally about merchant acquisitions in Maritime, some of the challenges therein, and some of the opportunities that we see. To help me out, I'm going to employ a map of ancient Greece to take us along on our journey. And I hope the technology works. <coughs> All right. First stop is Athens for a logic proof with some philosophers. That painting is actually in Rome, but it's called the School of Athens, so I figured it works. The hypothesis, mergers and acquisitions in shipping are rare. I think this has definitely been true to date, and I think there's some good reasons for this. So we're going to go through some premise, premises. Number one, roughly 100% of shipping company value is in the ships. Now, obviously management's extremely important, but when we talk about mergers and acquisitions, we're generally talking about one shipping company buying another, so that company already has management. I've yet to see a situation where a company is willing to pay for the ships and for management that it already has. Premise two, vessel sale and purchase is materially less expensive and less complicated than M&A. I think people probably agree with this, but in the next destination we'll see the disparity here is probably a lot bigger than you may think. Premise three, I'm pretty sure won't be controversial at all. Ship owners are smart. So, if the value of shipping companies is in the ships, and if sale and purchase is another way to get those ships more cost effectively, and ship owners are smart, then my hypothesis is probably correct. All right. Now we're going to the Peloponnese for some deal cost and considerations. And here I'm going to employ a couple of uh, Spartan wrestlers to help us out. I struggle with the ancient Spartan names. So the first wrestler is called Sale and Purchase. And the second one's called Mergers and Acquisitions. All right, so for round one, diligence. When you buy a ship, you look at class records, you inspect the vessel, maybe you do an underwater survey at the delivery port. Um, that's about it. When you do M&A, you can't read all those. It's a good reason there's a long list. That's probably a third of the actual list. But when you're talking about things like reading every board minute, reviewing cybersecurity plans, you can imagine it's more complicated than traditional sale and purchase. Round two, documentation. s and is very well established. You have a Norwegian sales form. You have some sales documentation. You have financing documentation in the event you're getting financing. For M&A, there's a whole host of things you have to do, term sheets, merger agreements, uh, you've got to do exclusivity agreements, you've got to have employment contracts, termination agreements, and all the documents with the SEC. Suffice to say, it's a lot more intense. <clears throat> Our M&A wrestler is not going to give up without a fight here. Uh, round three timing. Although it's a little longer on M&A, it can be a lot longer. Uh, one of the differences in S&P, when you buy a ship and you wait one to three months for delivery, you don't get those earnings. In mergers and acquisitions, you do because you're buying the company, and thus the earnings remain with the company. So we're going to call round three a draw. Round four, liability. S&P is back with a vengeance. There is none. The ship is purchased free and clear. In M&A, there is an assumption of liability. Clear win for S&P. And finally, we have transaction costs. In S&P, let's say 20, you're buying 25 vessels, let's say that costs roughly a half a million bucks. Of course, this excludes broker costs here, um, but I'm talking documentation diligence. M&A, same company, 25 vessels, you're probably talking about at least $10 million, could be a heck of a lot more. And of course, that excludes investment banking costs, but we're worth every penny. 
And the winner who gets the ancient Spartan uh, wrestling belt is Salem Purchase. All right, one more difficulty with M&A. We go to the island of Hios, which apparently has some ship owners there, uh, for some social issues. All right, uh, this is a cafeteria, I believe, which sounds like a place where everyone gets together and no one disagrees about anything. So we're going to try to get some agreement. We need agreement on who's going to be the largest shareholder post-deal. We need to know who's going to run the company, who's going to be on the board. And we need to know who's going to manage the vessels. As you can imagine, these aren't always the easiest things to get decided. There's often conflicting views here. Uh, I can tell you that in my career, I've had more than one M&A deal fall apart because of these social issues. All right, so that's a terrible uh, pitch for M&A. Um, but there is hope. Uh, so we're going to try to find some of that. And to find that lost hope, we're going just outside of Santorini at the bottom of the seafloor where we're going to find the lost city of Atlantis. <clears throat> All right, so a lot of people will tell you, especially in the investment community, size and scale is so important. Bigger is better. Get big, get size. You know, I, I, I don't necessarily think size for size is sake is a good thing, but there are some clear advantages to being larger. So um, we're going to talk about the equity advantages later, but actually I want to focus more on the debt advantages first and some of the capital advantages. Uh, you probably can't read this, that's fine, you don't need to. The point is that this is a select list of public shipping companies. They're listed from top to bottom in terms of market cap. The larger companies are on the top. Those gray boxes, those columns represent different types of capital. So you have common equity, which everyone has, on the left. First mortgage debt on the right, which everyone has. In the middle, you've got convertible uh, equity preferred debt and unsecured bond and unsecured notes. As you can see, companies at the larger end of the spectrum have more capital sources. Uh, that's really important because in Wall Street, there's often a flavor of the month. And when that flavor becomes interesting to investors, it's great to be able to tap it. Um, usually that means it's a cost-effective financing. And the bigger you are, the easier it is to do that. All right, so now we're going to go to a more tangible um, cost advantage here, which is first loan margin. So first mortgage debt, uh, sorry, first mortgage margins. First mortgage debt's a key component, probably the key component to shipping capital structures. Um, as you can see, that trend line shows us that as the companies get bigger, the cost of uh, first lien debt goes down. Now, there's a lot of variation, but on average, the companies over a billion dollars in market cap have margins of 2.43%. Companies with set less than a billion dollars in market cap have margins of 3.23%. That's an 80 basis point differential. So to put that in context of numbers, if you're buying a resale Ultramax and it's going to cost you $25 million and you get 60% financing on that, uh, that's $15 million. 80 basis points is 120 grand a year. That's $329 a day. I think we all know, especially talking about Ultramaxes and dry bulk, there are times when that $329 a day can be pretty important. So there is an advantage to being bigger based on these numbers. Um, also, in terms of size on the equity side, look, the bigger you are, the more liquid you are. And that's because a lot of funds have size restrictions. So there's just sort of this intuitive aspect that the bigger you are, the more funds can invest in you. But it's actually mandated. A lot of funds out there have to invest in companies with a certain market cap. And so getting to that market cap brings in more investors. More available investors is going to increase liquidity. Increased liquidity helps valuation. And it becomes a virtuous circle here. Um, so there is an advantage to size and scale. And one easy way to get that is through M&A. All right. <clears throat> Lastly, we're going to make some predictions. And I don't think I'm qualified to do so. So we're going to go to Delphi and talk to the Oracle. All right. And I really am, because this is the part I don't have. I've got to see what she gave us here. All right. Um, so prediction one is, we don't expect M&A unless at least one of the companies are public. And I think that's hopefully very clear by the early part of the presentation. If you're not public, you can just buy and sell ships. It's a lot easier. It's a lot less liability, a lot less costly. Prediction two, we don't expect all cash M&A deals. We have seen them in the past. Stelmar in 2004, OMI in 2007, they were purchased for all cash. Since then, to my knowledge, I'm probably forgetting at least one. But I don't think there's been any all-cash deals. I know Quintana 
uh, when Excel bought Quintana, it was cash and shares. But everything we've seen recently has been a share deal. Um, so we don't expect cash deals. Prediction three, ships for shares is going to become a major middle ground between M&A and sale and purchase. So we've seen a, a lot of this actually recently. We saw Golden Ocean buy Quintana. We saw Eagle buy Green Ships. Uh, who else did we see? We saw oh, DHT buy BW. They bought those ships for shares. So from my understanding, it was more like an S&P transaction in terms of liability, et cetera, but they paid with shares. So that's clearly not going to be as cost effective as a traditional S&P deal, but there's a lot of advantages there embedded with the share deal. Um, so we're going to see a lot of that. I think it sort of matches the best of both worlds um, in terms of those combinations. Prediction four, we will still see full public-to-public M&A &public deals, um, like we saw with Euronav and Generate. I think these are going to be, there's got to be a few stipulations before these work. I think number one, the size and scale has to be big enough to justify the cost. You can't do this with a couple hundred million dollar market cap companies. The costs just get too outrageous. But when companies are large, it can make sense. Um, when large investors dominate the group and can kind of force some change, whether it's a ship owner that can force the change or a large institutional investor that can push a company in a direction. And when companies that are listed are listed on non-US exchange. For example, you know, Sting buying Navigate Products, um, T&K buying Till. Both those guys were listed on the New York, uh, sorry, on the Norwegian OTC, uh, having trouble getting liquidity, having trouble growing. It made sense that they were acquired by uh, U.S. entities. And prediction five, um, which is the big one, increased m and I think is going to be really, really good for the market. Uh, we talked about it for individual companies, but what we've seen in the past, when companies are encouraged to grow and investors are telling them to grow, a lot of people went out and ordered a bunch of ships. And that didn't end well for the industry. Um, increased M&A is a great way for companies to grow, to achieve that size and scale, without going out and over-ordering um, and spoiling what is going to look like a decent outlook on the market. Um, yeah, and I think that's it. The Oracle is done. Uh, that's all they have to say. I hope they're right, certainly on that last one. Um, and I've got time for questions if anyone has any. My, my HEO slide was my polite way of saying that. Uh, no, absolutely. There, there are big egos, and, um, and it's problematic. The one thing I will say is there's big egos in every industry, and so I think, um, you know, I think they, that does come into play. I think the difference in shipping, a lot of times the big egos uh, either have huge shareholdings uh, and or manage vessels, which maybe they don't do in, in other sectors where there's still big egos with CEOs and board members, et cetera. So I think it can be a little bit more challenging. Um, I think now that we're starting to see it and we're starting to see the positive reaction from the market, I think there is real value, you know, even if you're the guy that steps aside, I think the market, um, you know, really appreciates the combination, the size and scale that you helped create by making the combination happen. So kind of another way to get that ego going is get the investor community um, appreciating kind of what you've done. So I think we will see people more accepting of it than they otherwise would have been. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, that's a great question, and actually, that's one thing I didn't really touch on. We talked about some of the ship for share, share deals, or share for ship deals. I think we're going to see a lot more of that. I think it's going to come from some of those smaller companies that, that have a ticker, and for, there's a lot of private investments that have been made either by ship owners or a lot of funds that have ships, and maybe they don't want to sell, but maybe they're getting pressure to get some liquidity or to be able to have a mark, at least on the investor side. So by putting ships in for shares, that's a way for the company to raise money effectively raise the, the market cap, raise the equity value of the company without necessarily going to the market, which is difficult to do. I also think in some cases we're going to see 
private fleets, large fleets that maybe want a public mark, maybe want to be public, that have realized, hey, it's actually really difficult to go through the IPO process in the U.S. And it also, you know, you're sort of at the whims of the market. Whereas actually if you reverse merge into a company, maybe the company's only got 10 ships and you put in 30, maybe you take over, but it's the same company, the same ticker. So I think that's going to be two interesting ways that these smaller companies can do something, either issuing shares for ships and growing organically that way, or sorry, or growing that way, or potentially some reverse takeovers. No question, and I think this is going to, there's going to be some interesting opportunities, especially for guys that need to do things, uh, and I think we'll see growth in that way. Um, I think my time is up. Thanks very much. If my reverse psychology's worked and now you all want to do M&A, come talk to the friendly folks at RMK. Thanks, guys. Michael, thank you very much. Very interesting.